how big can a raindrop get? Just think about that for a second. Aren't we lucky that most rain that we've experienced falls as drops? And not like this. What's the biggest size of a raindrop that has ever been recorded? Is there a chance that rain could fall on us like a ball of bricks? And what effect would that have on our life? Let's find out on today's episode. Hi, I'm Nikhilesh. And I'm Kushal. And, and we're, we're the, the two broke scientists. scientists. There's a very simple experiment to see how big raindrops really are. It's something you can do at home. Just take a ball of flour and keep it out in the rain for a known period of time. The size of the pellets that form roughly correspond to the size of the raindrops. In fact, a scientist by the name of Wilson A. Bentley did the very same experiment. It was a controlled experiment which was then published in a scientific article. What he found was a distribution. To understand this, we will first have to go back to some primary school physics. Does the name water cycle ring a bell? Something we learnt in school about how water evaporates from the surface of the earth, rises up into the atmosphere, condenses and then falls back down as rain? Well, as it turns out, there's a little bit more to that story. When water evaporates, it forms water vapour, which starts rising into the atmosphere. Now, as the altitude increases and the temperature decreases, the dew point of this water vapour is reached and it starts condensing. But there's a small challenge here. For the water vapour in air to condense into droplets, it needs a trigger. Basically, something that acts as a nucleus around which the water vapour can condense. These triggers can be different things from small dust particles to other solid particles that are floating around in the atmosphere. And these triggers are called cloud condensation nuclei. When a lot of these condensed particles form, they make a cloud. But we usually don't see the same type of cloud everywhere in the sky. The variations of clouds we see are dependent on the altitude at which they exist and whether they are consisting of water or ice. Keep the altitude part in mind because it's pretty important when it comes to the size of the raindrops. On an interesting side note, have you ever wondered why when it rains the clouds are usually dark and grey but white usually? Let us know in the comments what you think is the reasoning behind this. So we've established that clouds are an accumulation of many many droplets of water. But not all clouds are capable of producing rain. Isn't water denser than air? Then how do clouds stay up in the air? The answer to that question is twofold. We told you that water droplets form around these cloud condensation nuclei. But what we didn't tell you was the size of these CCNs and the size of the water droplets that form around them. On average, the size of a cloud condensation nuclei is 0.0002 millimeters. That is absolutely tiny. Uh, the size of a water droplet that forms around these CCNs is about a hundred times bigger. So 0.02 millimeters, which is still very tiny. For reference, the average size of a droplet that say forms around the outside of a cold beverage is about five or six millimeters. So we, we established that these droplets are absolutely tiny, but they're still heavier than air. And that means that they fall. There are two forces that act on a falling object, gravity and air resistance. When cloud droplets smaller than 40 micrometers starts to fall, they experience something called a Stokes track. And as the velocity starts increasing, so does the track. At one point, the droplet reaches its terminal velocity, meaning the drag force balances out the gravitational force 
and the drop stops accelerating. The terminal velocity of a drop of radius 0.01 mm is about 0.012 m per second. What this means is a cloud at an altitude of 5 km takes about 5 days to fall down to the ground. This coupled with the natural updraft makes sure that the cloud stays up in the sky. This brings up an interesting point. It's now clear that the water droplets in the clouds cannot themselves fall as a rain. For that to happen, the terminal velocity should be higher and these raindrops should be able to resist the updraft and convection in the atmosphere. And that can only happen if the average raindrop is much bigger than the average cloud droplet. There are many different theories as to how cloud droplets grow in size before falling as a rain. Two of these theories are well accepted. One, the collision coalescence theory and two, the ice phase process. For the cloud droplets to become big enough to fall, pure condensation can't do the trick. Simple calculations shows that pure condensation is far too slow for the droplets to become bigger. From a volumetric view, it takes around 1 million cloud droplets of 10 micrometer radius to combine together to make one single layer. This would take ages if it were done naturally. And this is where the collision coalescence theory comes in. The collision coalescence theory is just as it sounds. As droplets start falling, they collide with other droplets. And some of these collisions lead to coalescence, which means bigger droplets, which means higher terminal velocity, more collisions, more coalescence, bigger droplets, a higher terminal velocity, and well, you get the point. The total amount of liquid water inside a cloud, as well as the amount of time that a liquid droplet spends inside a cloud, influences how large it can grow through the collision coalescence process. Obviously, the cloud height is a factor here, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Rising motion in a cloud tends to slow the downward speed of a falling droplet, which means that it can spend more time in a cloud droplet, meaning that it can grow bigger through this process. Remember the different types of clouds that we talked about? On the one hand, we have deep cumulus clouds with large convective updrafts. These clouds tend to produce the biggest droplets because the droplets spend a lot of time in, inside the clouds themselves. On the other hand, we have stratus clouds, which are typically not as thick and have very weak convective updrafts. The water droplets or the rain droplets that fall from these clouds are not big enough. Uh, and sometimes if the, if the atmosphere below the clouds is moist, they might reach the ground as a light drizzle. But if it's dry below the clouds, then they might even evaporate before they reach the ground. Interestingly, although the collision coalescence theory is very intuitive, most precipitation around the world occurs because of the second process, which is the ice phase process. The ice phase process occurs in cold clouds or clouds where the temperature is below 0 degrees Celsius. But that's not always the case. Just like how water vapor needs cloud condensation nuclei to form cloud droplets, for ice to form, there has to be an ice nucleus. Without an ice nucleus, water droplets can remain as liquids even up to temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius. This is the super cold state. Beyond minus 40 degrees Celsius, the water particles exist in the solid state. In the troposphere, the temperature decreases as the altitude starts increasing. This decrease in temperature means that water exists in different phases. At low elevations above freezing, these hydrometeors in the cloud exist as liquid droplets. At slightly higher altitudes and lower temperatures, they become super cool liquid droplets. And as the altitude keeps decreasing and the temperature decreases, a mixture of both solid, which is basically ice and liquid, super cool liquid droplets exist. Finally, at a point where the temperature is cold enough, all these hydrometeors will exist in the solid phase. Similar to what happens in the case of water droplets, these ice crystals also get replenished until they are big enough to fall down as precipitation. Depending on the local atmospheric conditions, this precipitation may occur uh, as one of many different forms. You may be familiar with some of these forms like uh, hail, snow, normal rain or even freezing rain. Amazing! So now we know water droplets get bigger and bigger either by the ice phase process or the collision coalescence process. All we have to do now is find out how big the raindrops can get and we are done. Not so fast. 
all that we talked about up till now was just half the story the real answer to the raindrop size question lies in what happens next the droplet falling stage remember our old friend aerodynamic drag well as it turns out drag doesn't just serve to decrease the velocity of these falling droplets because water is a liquid it has the property that it can deform and this little property causes a lot of strange but wonderful things to happen as the fo- as, as the droplet starts falling because nature prefers a state of low energy the droplets are initially spherical the spherical drop which is now in free fall experiences inertial force in the form of drag which then acts against the effects of surface tension and this interplay between the two forces causes the raindrop to deform the process of deformation however does not occur for droplets of all diameters it is determined or governed by a non dimensional number called the weber number the process of deformation and breakup occurs for diameters which correspond to weber number greater than 6 beyond this diameter the droplets become unstable and go through the ballooning process before finally fragmenting into much smaller droplets and because this happens mid fall the droplets don't have enough time to coalesce and grow in size isn't that just amazing even though much larger droplets can form in the upper atmosphere aerodynamic drag ensures that they break up into smaller and smaller droplets as they fall down now coming back to the experiments conducted by bentley and some others they found that the raindrop size that fell on the earth was actually a distribution and it's obviously not just a single size and this distribution actually depended on the intensity at which the rain fell or the intensity of the rainfall basically now they plotted this distribution on a graph and on the x axis you have the number of droplets and on the y axis you have the size of a droplet of each of these droplets now this graph is a log scale graph which basically means that there are many many more number of droplets which are smaller than those which are actually bigger now coming to the final answer of our whole video the largest droplet that has ever been recorded has been found to be only about 1 cm in diameter thanks for watching we hope you enjoyed it and gained a bit more perspective of how nature takes care of us even though we barely pay heed as always don't forget to like share subscribe bye